The purpose of the five W's is to take a focused approach on a patient to determine the most common cause of postoperative fever and the order in which they occur. It's a focused approach rather than a shotgun approach. For example, if you're paged to the ER for a patient with fever who is three days postoperative, we need to know the most likely cause of the fever based upon the time frame after surgery. And the five W's is a tool to help us determine the most common cause. It's quite simple. Know the five W's. She's still short of breath. Did you get an ABG or a chest film? Oh, yes, sir, I did. And what did you see? Oh, well, I, uh, I had a lot of patients last Name night. the common causes of post-op fever. Uh, yes. From your so. head, not from a book. Don't look it up and learn it. It should be in your head. Name the common causes of post-op fever. Uh, the common causes of post con Can anybody name the common causes of post-op fever? The five W's quite simply helps us know the most common cause of our post-operative fever based upon the time frame. Remember, most of the time when post-operative fever occurs, it's within the first 48 hours, first two days after surgery. Wind is the first W. We need to know that wind occurs within the first 24 to 48 hours after surgery. It's the first acute phase of fever after surgery. If your surgical patient experiences fever intraoperatively, we must immediately, because it's an emergency, think malignant hyperthermia. Do we remember the treatment for malignant hyperthermia? You must know that. Atelectasis is a complete or partial collapse of a portion of the lung. It occurs when portions of the lung become deflated or filled with fluid. It's one of the most common breathing complications after surgery. It should be noted that it's probably coincidental that atelectasis is associated with fever, probably not causing the fever. It happens because the post-operative patient spends the majority of their time laying in bed, and that leads to incomplete expansion of the lungs. Usually the patients are in pain, or they are sedated in some way, and so they have a difficult time clearing their pulmonary secretions, and it's very difficult uh, following intubation and general anesthesia to get rid of the fluids. One of the most common treatments for atelectasis is a incentive spirometer. So it's important to know how to use this and you can prescribe this to a patient that you've done an extensive surgery on that you know this patient is going to be laying in bed immobilized for a long period of time. Maybe you've admitted them to the hospital. You want to prescribe an ins incentive spirometer. You actually have the patient breathe in and this will elevate a dial on the spirometer to a certain level. And that's how you know they're doing a good full breath in. And that's how you do your treatment with that. Next is water. Urinary tract infections occur at about day two to three. So anytime older than 48 hours after surgery. UTIs are the most common hospital acquired infections in the USA, accounting for up to 40% of all hospital acquired infections. Now, know your patient, because if you do surgery on a patient that doesn't receive a catheter, they're less likely to get a UTI. So most of the time in podiatry or foot and ankle surgery, no catheters are needed. It's usually elective surgery, and so this is great, easy to rule out in a podiatry that it's probably not a UTI. Know the symptoms of a UTI can include fever, suprapubic or flank pain, costa vertebral angle tenderness, or urinary urgency. If you do suspect a UTI, do a urinalysis or urine culture. Next is wound, and this is one of the most important ones because when you have a post-operative complication, this is the most common post-operative complication, infection. Surgical site infection peaks at about day five to seven after surgery. So that's when you have the patient come into clinic so that you can check for any type of soft tissue infection. If you do any time before day five, 
then you're not going to be able to see any infection. And you don't want to wait too long because then you're going to go days without treating the infection. Any fever that develops after day two is probably going to be a surgical site infection. You need to be able to identify a surgical site infection. Erythema, warmth, pain, tenderness, purulent drainage. The most common pathogens for soft tissue site infections are skin flora. It makes sense because you're cutting into skin. So you're going to see bugs like staphylococcus. You might see streptococcus. You might see enterococcus. Know your patient. Is your patient immunocompromised? And by that, I mean, are they diabetic? Do they have poor nutrition? Do they smoke? You need to be able to look for an abscess. Anytime there's an abscess, you must do an incision and drainage. You need to consider hardware. If there's an infection and the hardware is infected, then most of the time the hardware needs to come out. It's one of the worst things that can happen. Next is walk, or should I say lack of walking. This occurs at about post-operative day seven or about one week after surgery. You really gotta know the symptoms here. Red, hot, swollen, painful calf with cramping. Can present with a low-grade fever, but that's not always the case. Patients with a suspected DVT should be screened with a lower extremity Doppler ultrasound and started on therapeutic anticoagulation when clinically safe. Something you could be asked about is the Homan sign or the Pratt sign. The Homan's test is done with the patient in the supine position with the knee extended and the leg raised to about 10 degrees. The ankle is then passively and abruptly dorsiflex and the calf is squeezed. A painful or tender calf could indicate the presence of a DVT. In contrast, the Pratt's test involves the patient lying in the supine position with the knee flex. The examiner will grasp the calf with both hands, pressing on the popliteal veins in the proximal calf. If the patient feels pain, then it could indicate a DVT. The final W is wonder drugs. There's not much to be said about this one because any drug can cause post-operative fever or fever. Antimicrobials and heparin can be a culprit here. It's really important to just review the medication list with the patient. And if you do suspect that a drug is causing the fever to stop that specific drug and see if the patient improves. Here's a few questions that we can try. A patient presents 48 hours status post first MPJ arthrodesis presents to the ER fever. What is the least likely cause of fever? The answer is D, surgical site infection. So 48 hours, the point here being that surgical site infections usually are days five to seven. It can go up to day three. So the point being, it's less likely for a patient to present two days after surgery with a surgical site infection. You are thinking other things at that point. That's the whole point of this whole lecture was to know the time frame of each W. While performing an Austin bunionectomy, a 45-year-old male patient begins to show increased body temperature, mild muscle rigidity, tachycardia. What is the most likely cause of the fever? The answer is D malignant hyperthermia. This is a medical emergency and it's seen within the first few moments of administering a certain type of anesthetic and it's a reaction and it's a medical emergency requiring dantrolene. Next, you've received a call from the nurse regarding a 55 year old male who had an uncomplicated open reduction internal fixation of a supination external rotation type four fracture repaired this morning. The patient just spiked a fever of 102.4. On your initial evaluation, he is tachycardiac with a heart rate of 110 beats per minute, blood pressure of 140 over 85 millimeters of mercury. His SpO2 is 94% on room air and his respirations are 18 and unlabored. What is your next best step? The answer is A and B. 
So when you see a question like this, you'll see a ton of information. Just look at the timing here. The patient had surgery this morning, and that's really the most important part of this whole question. So what is your next best step here? We're thinking more of the acute phase. So we're thinking more wind. So we know wind, atelectasis, pneumonia. We don't think that it is malignant hyperthermia because it's not happening intraoperatively. We don't think it's an infection because it's not several days after we've done surgery. So we're thinking the best answer here would be A and B. You are paged to the ER to see postoperative patient day seven with a low grade fever. You know a positive Homan's test. What is your next step? So remember a Homan's test is done with the patient in the supine position, the leg about 10 degrees elevated and the knee extended, and then you're gonna aggressively dorsiflex and squeeze the back of the leg at the calf area. So if you notice a positive Homan's test, you're gonna wanna do a test to rule out DVT, which is A, a duplex ultrasound. So important to know Homan's test, Pratt's test, that's all associated with the uh, DVT, which DVT and pulmonary embolism are usually on day seven. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you learned something. Can anybody name the common causes of post-op fever? Wind, water, wound, walking, wonder drugs. The five W's. Most of the time it's wind, splinting, or pneumonia. Pneumonia is easy to assume, especially if you're too busy to do the tests.